Hororo tu wawo to po tu wawo tau tu wawo nga tataramoi i aramai ra kau tau kiro ti te fare Horomai come on in come on in Horomai Ara tu ya ki arangi nu ye tu nei tu ya ki papa tu anu ku e ta koto nei ka rongo te motu te au i te kore ro pu ata i te mara mahu nu ku i te mara mahu rangi ara ke nga ma ta wa ka hara mai e nga hau e toru ki te tau toko ta au tua wa i te nei ya i ai te nei ai ai ki te wa kare wa tu ra te nei uri tau o te nei koro eke ara te koro eke nei i tai rawe ake ano ki to na uri tau a fitu te kau marima no mai hara mai ki te fakatai ranga te ki te wakare wanga o te nei kau papa faka hira hira ki te faka nui atu te mau mahara o nga tau e pahuri aki nei ara kai nga ma ta waka no mai hara mai kai rau te pare rau o to ta tau fare te nei fare te fare pare mata o au te aroa te fare pare mata o niu tirini no mai hara mai Kei runga wai te tii, nau mai hara mai kei raru i te mana nui o tō tātou māngai, te māngai o te whare, ara te nā koe. Nā nai whātora atura, te tātou mā koutou e hara mai nei, o tia nō rā huriatu ki ngā tini ai tua kua whetūrangi tia e oki oki. O tia nō rā, kei ngā mātauaka, kei ngā hauewha, hara mai. Te nei, te rau kura o te atiawa, ara te tehi wawai, te nei wawai o ngā te toa e whakatau kia koutaue i roto i te nei whare i te nei ahi hei nei. Nō reira kari e te kūmia ro, o tia nō rā, te nei he whakatau kia koutau kei ngā mātāwaka. O tia nō rā i mua i taku waiata, mā koe whakataka toa tūra ngā tikango o te whare. Hoia nō rā, kia koutau, te nei e tūtira mai nei, ki te whakanui atura tēnei, tēnei ahi ahi. And rather than me saying, I'd like you all to join in if you know the words. Tu tira mai ngā iwi, tātou tātou e. Tu tira mai ngā iwi, tātou tātou e. Whai a te maramatanga, me te aroha e ngā iwi. Kia tapatahi, kia kotahira, tātou, tātou e, tātou, tātou e. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce you to my tuakana. Kei tō kurangatira, kei tō kofanaunga, tēnā koe gia. Tēnā koe e kura. Kia koutou nei, e oi oi nei, tēnei pō, tēnā koutou, kā tau toko ngā mi i kia koutou nei, mai a tātou nei iwi, o ngā ti tō aranga tira, me te ati awa nui tonu, nō reira tēnā nō tātou. I'd like to just, oh, that's good. Some of the artists are here, some of the organisers are right here beside me. Piri Kaui, Jill Oakley, Simon Bowden, Bay Riddell, Rob Thorne, and other exhibiting artists who are here. It's great to see a few more others. I'm Gary Nicholas from Toi Māori Aotearoa, Māori Arts New Zealand. And we were approached by Jill um, last year with a big idea, big outside exhibition spaces, um, bigger than Ben Hur. And when she said what the reason was, the, the 75th anniversary, I said, wow, that sounds fantastic, yeah. We only ever hear from the United Nations every 10 years, 20 years, 75 years. But we're always proud to be part of it. So, Jill, thank you for this. I better stick to the script. That's what the staff said. Uh, to our host, uh, the Right Honourable Trevor Mellard, members of the Diplomatic Corps, members of Parliament, exhibiting artists and organisers of the evening's event. I acknowledge the United Nations Association of New Zealand and thank you for this opportunity to promote cross-cultural dialogue 
on the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals through the exhibition Whenua Ukaipo. I want to acknowledge the additional support that's come from the Wellington City Council and UNESCO. Tonight, each of us renews our personal commitment to Te Aho Mutunga Kore, the never-ending thread of friendship of humanity, a bind emblematic of the highest ideals of the United Nations. The United Nations 75th anniversary, 2020 and beyond, requires us to examine the past to better inform our future. A Māori proverb, Titiru Hokomuri ki a tika ai te anga hokamua, inflects the same sentiment that we must look back to our past successes, some of our past failures, that we may better see what the future lies ahead. Māori language abounds with proverbs that give confidence and ease with erring on the side of care for the earth and the land we stand upon. Whatu ngaro ngaro te tangata, toi tu te huenua. While human life is fleeting, the earth is transfixed. The title Huenua Kaipo for Māori speaks of the land on which you were nurtured. For refugees and immigrants, this becomes a metaphor for retaining the precious values and beliefs of your forebears. While the land of your birth may be left elsewhere, you must invest your time in the new lands and the new communities, contributing strength and richness. Seventeen guest artists converge to express their perspectives of humanity's relationship to the land. The exhibition at the Old Public Trust Hall on the corner of Lambton Quay and Stout Street has been transformed into an amazing exhibition. Opening on Saturday morning, the 31st of October, and running through to Wednesday, the 4th of November, it will deliver over those five days a wealth of experiences. At this stage, I'd like to call upon Rob, Rob Thorne, uh, to come forward, because we have here a piece by Bay Riddell, artist, the male one with the hat, and a very senior member of our community of ceramic artists. Uh, Kaihanga Uku was a collective of ceramic artists who could draw from the Earth Mother and to create forms. The narrative was anchored within Māori thinking around the forming of the first human within Māori thinking. And so from that, uh, Bay has been a tremendous leader in that movement. Uh, Toi Māori is working with Bay for next year and the year after to put together a book which will celebrate the success and in some cases to mourn the loss of people like Manos Nathan and Colin Ehrlich who were also trailblazers in that movement. So if Rob is here. Up by.
Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Rob. Rob of Ngāti Tumutumu is an exponent and an expert in the plane of traditional Māori instruments. It's a movement that has arisen from what was considered to be a lost art form. In the 1940s and 50s, uh, the words were spoken that this, this sound would never be heard again in our living time. That's not true. And like a lot of things, we can revive them if we study them and we understand them. And we thank those exponents who have brought that back to us. Like all treasures that belong to us, can be refound and returned to us. And one of those is our great love and respect for the lands in which we live and the environments in which we can control. I was just looking in terms of the synergy between the stance of the warrior saying and threatening and saying, what lies before me? I fear nothing. And there was Rob paying tribute to it through his performance and through his sounds. Uh, to you both, artists, exponents of your own particular art practice, I make it to you both and I thank you very much. Thanks everybody. Tēnā koto, tēnā koto, tēnā koto katoa. Now my haere mai, ki te rūpū whakakotahi, whenua Aotearoa. Haere mai ki te whare paramata. Ko gaia toku ingoa. Ko tēne te mihi atu ki a koto. Your Excellencies, members of the Diplomatic Corp, members of Parliament, members and supporters of the United Nations Association of New Zealand. As the Vice President of the Association, may I extend a very warm welcome to you all as we mark the 75th anniversary of the United Nations. The future we want, the United Nations we need, reaffirming our collective commitment to multilateralism. As we know, UND marks the anniversary of the entry into force in 1945 and the UN Charter. 24th October has been celebrated as United Nations Day since 1948. The purpose of this event is to celebrate the achievements of the United Nations for the last 75 years, facing many great challenges, especially during the recent pandemic of COVID-19 not forgetting that we live in an imperfect world. Now, I want to acknowledge uh, and thank our host, the Right Honourable Trevor Mallard, MP Speaker, 52nd Parliament. Um, we are looking forward to hearing from you. Please welcome the Right Honourable Trevor Mallard. Tēnākoto, uh, tēnākoto, tēnākoto katoa. Um, Welcome to uh, the, our special guests, the members of the uh, Diplomatic Corps, uh, community volunteers, students, uh, and, and friends uh, to uh, this uh, event uh, to mark the United Nations at 75. Um, I was trying to work out when I first went to a United Nations Association uh, event uh, and some people will possibly be able to help me, but Jim Belich was the president uh, at the time, uh, which probably means that it was over 40 years ago, and I shudder to think that it might have been closer to 50. Um, Jim was a, 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 a neighbour uh, and, uh, and someone who made a lot of contribution, both to the United Nations Association and, and to Wellington uh, as mayor. 
And it's sort of interesting for me uh, that uh, his granddaughter uh, was elected in the most recent elections as a, as a member of parliament. So it's one of these things that keep on, it keeps on going round. Makes me feel slightly old. Um, one of my most significant duties uh, as Speaker uh, for the 52nd Parliament was to uh, lead our international engagement uh, team. Um, it's, I don't think it's a secret that people from offshore um, have a more inflated view of the role of the Speaker than the average New Zealander does. Uh, and, and therefore, uh, I think it's fair to say that on occasions I was wheeled out uh, in order to uh, promote uh, New Zealand's interests. And that was a real privilege uh, in, in Europe, in Africa, and Asia, uh, and especially in the Pacific, where we started a series of speakers' tours uh, around the, with, with the Pacific. Um, but a, a real highlight for me was to uh, lead the first New Zealand speakers group to Rwanda uh, to join the uh, commemorations of the 25th anniversary of the Rwandan genocide. Uh, we provided a set of um, diplomatic cables uh, from the time. It was a, it was a very uh, full set uh, or volumes uh, of cables uh, which uh, at the time implored international uh, action. Um, and I know that we're going to be hearing from uh, Colin Keating soon. I won't take too much of a sunder to say, other than to say, um, that the, our failure at the time, um, I think, is one of the biggest embarrassments, the failure of the United Nations at the time not to follow the New Zealand views is one of the biggest embarrassments of the history of the United Nations. Um, and one of the greatest uh, feelings for me as a New Zealander was to go into the genocide memorial and to see a small wall there of the allies and heroes, the supporters uh, of the people of Rwanda from the time. And there was, one, there was one white face on the wall, and it was Colin Keating. So as a, you know, as a New Zealander, not the fact it was a white face, but the fact, the fact that he was essentially the only person from outside Africa who was regarded as a hero and a supporter was something that made me sort of deeply, deeply proud to be a New Zealander. And 25 years on, I was really encouraged by the optimism uh, of the Rwanda people. Uh, the UN Sustainable uh, Development Goal 16 is all about peace, justice and strong institutions. This is a place uh, where uh, an institution where governments are held to account, where laws are passed, uh, where budgets are approved. Uh, and I think it's a really important check uh, on executive power. We are part of a global community of parliaments. The, uh, we might be the 75th anniversary of the United Nations now, but the Inter-Parliamentary inter Union was formed in 1889. Uh, and uh, New Zealand was a co-sponsor uh, of a resolution on cooperation uh, between the Parliamentary Union uh, and the uh, United Nations as recently as September. Uh, my view is that it is absolutely imperative that we work collaboratively to share knowledge and to maintain the integrity of the multilateral system. So, therefore, once more, I welcome you to Parliament. I won't give you a health and safety briefing, but I, but I hope that you enjoy tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you. The Right Honourable Trevor Mallard. This evening, uh, we are privileged to have three keynote speakers who are Her Excellency Amira Wolberg, Ambassador of Netherlands, Chris Seed, Chief Executive and Secretary of Foreign um, Affairs and Trade, and Colin Keating, former permanent representative of New Zealand to the United Nations. Following them, 
we are delighted to present uh, Mark Howard, the national president of um, UN Youth New Zealand, a video message uh, from Louis Auburn, United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, and Macy Bentley, our UN's executive officer, will wrap up the speeches by reading the UN Charter preamble. Our first keynote speaker, Her Excellency Mira Wolberg, is the ambassador of the Kingdom of the Netherlands to New Zealand, Fiji, Samoa, Tonga, Kiribati, and Tuvalu. The ambassador has been working at the Netherlands Ministry of Foreign Affairs since 1998. She has held several offices at the ministry in The Hague, as well as postings abroad in Jakarta, Indonesia, and New York, United States of America, and has been posted in New Zealand since 2018. Distinguished guests, please welcome Her Excellency Mira Wolberg. Thank you. Enga mana, enga reo, enga karanga tanga, tena koto, tena koto, tena koto katoa. Ko voltberg te manga, ko eisel te awa, ko mira taku ingwa, kia ora, tena koto katoa. I would like to thank you also, uh, Gaia, uh, the Vice President of the UN Association, Aotearoa, uh, for your very nice uh, words and for organizing this event and asking me to speak because the UN is a very dear and very important part of my life as a diplomat um, since 1998. Uh, I would like also to acknowledge uh, the right and honorable uh, Trevor Mullard and of course distinguished representatives uh, uh, from like the former uh, New Zealand, uh, uh, of not former permanent representatives that I see in the room, but also definitely a lot of former UN colleagues in, in the room. And I saw and have been at the presentation of the book just before this, um, this meeting today, of this, this evening. And I think I, I probably should have read that before because then I would probably know much more as we are a small country, what would be actually the effect. So maybe I'm now too positive. But we, I will have a book, I will read a book and I hope everyone will write and read the book actually. Um, I also would like to acknowledge the UN Youth President uh, who is here uh, and several uh, representatives of the community organizations. I think definitely civil society is an extremely important part of the UN family and without uh, them I wouldn't be able to do my work in, uh, in New York without the valuable input that, that you all deliver. And that will be the, definitely is also the case for the think tanks uh, UN associations, uh, the youth, uh, the UN youth. So thank you for being here. And this month we celebrate 75 years of the United Nations and despite this milestone uh, there is no big celebration. We saw empty corridors during the last General Assembly leader summit. There was no like no limousines, um, no people in the plenary. While celebrating 75 years, its member states face another challenge, the COVID-19 pandemic. A pandemic which magnified existing problems around inequality, poverty, human rights, gender equality, inequality, climate, and much more. But the COVID crisis was also, was also, uh, has also forced us to face the facts. In times of crisis, we have to work together Nobody can face this crisis alone. Nobody can develop a vaccine alone. We need all creativity, innovation, and science around the world to fight the virus. And we need to look out for each other, not only our families, neighbors, and fellow nationals, but definitely also for other countries and peoples, regardless of the borders between us. Countries that might not have similar resources like our friends in the Pacific. It is another crisis in which the United Nations plays a crucial role, and for the Netherlands this is an important, very crucial role. It exemplifies cooperation and support between countries, such as with the COVAX um, initiative around the vaccine, but also the UN COVID-19 Response and Recovery Fund, initiated by the UNSG. 
The Netherlands fully supports both initiatives, and we are of the firm opinion that the WHO plays a crucial role and that we all must provide the necess necessary resources it needs. These are examples of international solidarity, however, in times that this multilateral system is under great pressure. And as a small-sized country in Europe, the Netherlands suffered greatly from the war between the European states. It was not surprising that my country was really eager to join international consultative bodies after the Second World War. From the start in 1945, it was a member of the United Nations, but the Netherlands was also a founding member of the NATO, European Community, and later the European Union. One can say multilateralism is at the heart of the Dutch foreign policy. Even the Dutch royal family is actively engaged, in fact, in the United Nations, and some of you have may, might seen them, but also Queen Maxima is a special advocate from the inclusive finance, and our king was actively engaged in, the, in water management. We are one of the 10 biggest donors to the multilateral system, and we try to play a constructive role with our like-minded countries and partners and friends, such as New Zealand. We not only stress that in joint statements that as like-minded countries we share certain values, but we really bring this in practice by closely working together to achieve progress on difficult issues, on issues such as cybersecurity, and as um, Nicola Hill also pointed out, on advocating women's rights, LGBTI rights, um, issues like climate change. And we try to support each other initiatives. And it, is very, it sounds very practical, but it is absolutely crucial because this is what the UN is about. It's about cooperation and trying to support and bring things and issues further. And New Zealand was very, very helpful, actually, uh, and some are also here in the room, to prepare our team for our seat in the Security Council. Crucial information. How as a small country can you actually operate effectively in this body and top of the international diplomacy. As the Netherlands, we are also sharing our expertise with other member states, such as on climate adaptation, a topic which is really in, our, in the DNA of our kingdom, which is made of low-lying delta in the north of Europe, but also several small islands in the Caribbean. And therefore, in January 2021, we will host an online climate adaptation summit to help the world better prepare for the effects of climate change. And we definitely hope to welcome New Zealand in one of these online debates. Another Dutch focus within the UN system is providing a base for the international legal order. My hometown, The Hague, is host to the International Criminal Court and the International Court of Justice. The Dutch government considers it of great importance to continue supporting these crucial institutions and use them when necessary, even though it becomes harder and harder in recent years to achieve accountability, due mainly to the resistance of a small number of countries. This is also why the Netherlands announced to hold Syria responsible under international law for serious violations of its obligations under the Convention Against Torture. And we decided together with Canada to support the Gambia in its efforts to address Myanmar's alleged genocide against the Rohingya before the International Court of Justice. We do think we, we should use the measures that we worked so hard to achieve and uh, bring accountability to the forefront. The multilateral world order, which has given us so much in the decades since the World War II, is however, as I said before, under pressure. That's why the Netherlands stresses that all countries need to take responsibility for the proper functioning of the multilateral system, take a constructive approach, and while standing up for one's own interest, don't lose sight of the common interest. Honor the agreements we have made and respect international law, including human rights, there is also a need to critically assess the system itself. And as my Prime Minister Rutte said this year in the General Assembly, and he stressed it, and, and people have, have said that as well, 
you can't tackle today's challenges with yesterday's structures. It's essential that we improve, reform, and modernize our global institutions. And during our recent membership of the UN Security Council, the Netherlands worked very hard to actually uh, on these practical UN forms in the area of peacekeeping. We very much support also the UN SDGs reform agenda. We really hope that we make together the UN fit for purpose, well equipped, operating in an effective and transparent manner. Because the new generations who are already making their voices heard, and some of them have been, are also here in the room, um, must be able to count on a solid global system of multilateral cooperation, supporting their aspirations. It's therefore of great importance that we engage youth in UN matter. And a good example is, for example, the UN uh, model of the model United Nations. And um, my embassy in Wellington always supports each year uh, the team that represents the Netherlands. But unfortunately, this year, due to COVID, this was the model UN had to be cancelled. But I'm really hopeful and strongly hope that it will be possible to do that next year, as this is an important tool to engage uh, youth. Um, let me conclude by saying that the UN are us, and it's about the Netherlands, about New Zealand and other countries um, to, to, to improve it. But it is even more also about the people, dedicated diplomats, UN staff, about inspiring civil society, youth representatives. It's about the dynamics private sector, um, think tanks that are active in the forum. And I represented the Netherlands many times in the United Nations, including four and a half years in New York. And it was really a privilege to work with so many inspiring and committed people. Therefore, I'm not an, um, and therefore I'm an optimist, because I really think that the UN might not be perfect, just like us, but if structures do not support the purpose of the organization or do not fully represent current membership, we carefully have to look at it and, um, and, and cooperate to make it better. I look forward to work with you and definitely with our New Zealand friends uh, to reform the United Nations to uh, make, that mo make it the best possible response to the challenges of the 21st century and far beyond. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. Before I move on to our next speaker, can I please invite all the speakers up on stage, please? Our next keynote speaker, Chris Seed, Chief Executive and Secretary of Foreign Affairs and Trade, first joined MFED in 1985. He was a Deputy Secretary for the Australia, Pacific, Europe, Middle East, and Africa Group from 2008 to 2013. He took up the role of Chief Executive and Secretary in February 2019. Prior to taking up this position, Chris spent five years as New Zealand's High Commissioner to Australia. Distinguished guests, members and friends, please welcome Chris Seed. Ina mana, ina reo, tena koutou katoa. It's wonderful to see so many friends of the UN here tonight. Guy, thank you for the introduction. It's wonderful to see so many colleagues who have served the foreign ministry and served New Zealand uh, in the pursuit of our interests in the, in the United Nations. It's one of the proud traditions of the New Zealand Foreign Service about the expertise that so many of our people bring to bear in making the UN system work, uh, creating ideas, understanding, process, 
being great negotiators, understanding the law, bringing all of that to bear, not only for New in New Zealand's interests, but for our region. So I acknowledge uh, all of them and the many um, of the people who serve today, but also those on whose shoulders we stand, including um, Colin uh, and many other colleagues in this room. It's wonderful to see you all. Uh, it was out of the devastation, of course, of World War II that nations pledged to save successive generations from the scourge of war. So it was uh, the world gathered in San Francisco 75 years ago to found the United Nations. New Zealand was there, and since that time has championed the United Nations and the wider international system. And it's worth recalling why we have made those investments over such a long period of time. A geographically remote and small nation needs deep connections regionally and globally. Te Tiriti o Waitangi requires of us a genuine partnership and the search for shared solutions. One of the great things our diplomats take to the world, that New Zealanders take to the world, is that, national, that reconciliation sits at the heart of the national project in New Zealand. It's a very powerful lever and part of our brand in the world. So it follows that our place in the world and our history as a country drives us to seek common purpose, to find strength and diversity, to strive for a more equal society and to build strong institutions that promote fairness and deliver for all people. These values have guided our approach to global cooperation with the UN at its centre for seven decades. We acknowledge that the UN we need today of course, and for the future is not the same one that was founded in 1945. However, as the world changes at an ever faster pace and the challenges we face are increasingly global, it's clear that we do need a highly functioning and effective United Nations system now more than ever. The safe, prosperous and sustainable future we seek for New Zealanders is threatened this year much more than ever by COVID-19, by the COVID-19 pandemic. We have tackled it at home with determination, speed and vigilance, with good science, with good policy and great teamwork. The overwhelming majority of countries are still, however, in its grip. But we know here in New Zealand that no one is safe until everyone is safe. That's why defeating this virus globally requires a collective, determined and speedy effort, which includes working together to develop and distribute a vaccine on an equitable basis. That's why the New Zealand government supports the World Health Organization and the critical role it has played in coordinating a global response to the pandemic. And it's also why, through supporting the what's known as the COVAX facility, New Zealand demonstrates its commitment to ensuring vulnerable communities everywhere, including in the Pacific, receive the vaccines they need. But while a vaccine would return normality to our lives, it may take years to recover from the socio-economic impacts of the pandemic. So in the Pacific, the pandemic has, is, has and is amplifying the significant constraints to economic resilience already faced by Pacific Island countries, and their outlook is very challenging. During the high-level segment of the current General Assembly session la uh, last month, New Zealand called for countries to work together for a global economic recovery that protects the most vulnerable, creates jobs, and maintains supply chains and open markets. Our ambition has been and continues to be to build back better. And an important part of building back better for New Zealand includes a focus on the environment. Last month again in New York we called for a rethink on how our societies can simultaneously focus on the well-being of our people and of our environment. And of course the threat of climate change is more real in the Pacific than in any other region. Sea level rise poses an extreme threat to the countries whose home is this ocean, the one that laps our shores. Our Pacific Island neighbours rely on the United Nations and its member states 
to make political decisions and commitments to protect their future and then give those commitments practical and financial effect. Their future is in our hands and requires full implementation of the Paris Agreement. At the same time, this is an opportunity for a global reset towards a more green economy, which is why New Zealand is calling for a stop to fossil fuel subsidies. In a very practical way, we argue that the opportunity to divert these billions of dollars into transitioning to clean energy generation is an opportunity this generation needs to grab. Similarly, the critical importance that di di sorry, biodiversity plays in ensuring the welfare of our young people, the economy and the environment, was highlighted at the uh, high-level summit on biodiversity held in New York in late September. As we all know, biodiversity all over the world is in serious decline. The time for action is now. And New Zealand is stepping up with the launch of Tamana Te Oteu Tau the Aotearoa New Zealand Biodiversity Strategy to guide the way we protect and restore nature. At the summit, New Zealand urged all member states to join us in increasing our ambition on biodiversity protection as one of the best investments in our global future. We can't talk about best investments, however, without talking about women's empowerment and gender equality. On the 1st of October, the UN marked the 25th anniversary of the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action, adopted at the Fourth World Conference on Women, which established the roadmap for gender equality. New Zealand recognised in that event that the report card could be described as good progress should do much better. At that commemorative event, New Zealand recommitted to the goals set in Beijing 25 years ago, and to supporting our neighbours in the Pacific on their journey. Again, similarly, at recent events to mark the 75th anniversary of the atomic bombings in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, New Zealand recalled the devastating humanitarian consequences of the use of nuclear weapons. More than 13,000 of them remain in existence today, each one many times more powerful than either of those used in Hiroshima or at Nagasaki. New Zealand believes the experts on this matter. No state or organisation can prepare for the unimaginable suffering which would flow from the use of nuclear weapons. So New Zealand believes if we cannot prepare, we must prevent, which is why New Zealand ratified the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons and played an important part in its negotiation. The treaty achieved its 50th ratification on 24 October, triggering its entry into force. In a notable coincidence, also the day which marked the anniversary of the entry into force of the UN Charter in 1945. The treaty's global prohibitions on nuclear weapons is a necessary step on the way towards their total elimination and a safer world. So just to recap, I've touched tonight about the centrality of multilateralism, effectively of the United Nations, to New Zealand's values and our interests in the world, of the investment New Zealand makes in the international system to help build a safer, more prosperous and more sustainable future for New Zealanders. I've mentioned the challenges and opportunities that the COVID-19 pandemic brings, building back better through vaccine multilateralism, a global reset to a greener economy, stepping up to the intergenerational agenda on climate change, biodiversity loss, gender equality and nuclear disarmament. Pursuing these issues to solution though is the challenge for the United Nations of our era. On 21 September in New York, member states adopted a, the, a, the call to action, the future we want, the UN we need was both a call and a question, a call for all countries to step up and face shared challenges with political will, and an invitation to all peoples to question, listen, and reflect on the achievements as much as the shortcomings of the past, drawing from those insights to reimagine 
the United Nations of the future. There's been a dialogue globally, including here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, and convened by the UN. The voice of young people has been loud and we would be wise to listen. It's their future. The voice of indigenous communities and cultures is richly conveyed in the exhibition Whenau, whenau um, ukapo, ukapo, which was, we've heard tonight, uh, which was on the screen, my compliments to the artist whose work we see tonight. It's a vision of connectedness inspired by the sustainable development goals and it speaks to us today in this hall. Again, we would be wise to listen. Uh, I encourage you all to visit the full exhibition at the Public Trust Hall from 31 October, runs through until 4 November. And finally, on behalf of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade, my thanks to the United Nations Association of New Zealand for bringing together this evening New Zealanders from all walks of life. What unites everyone in this room, I think, is a shared interest in the work of the United Nations and in trying to make the world a better place, a safer, more prosperous and more sustainable future for the globe and for all New Zealanders. No tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, katoa. Thank you, Chris Seed. Our next speaker, Colin Keating, is a former permanent res representative of New Zealand to the United Nations. He served from 1993 to 1996 and on the Security Council from 1993 to 1994, present for the both Rwandan genocide and the mission to Somalia. During UN Day last year, Colin Keating challenged us, New Zealand, to commit in taking the lead to enhance and implement multilateralism. Since then, he and Dr. Kennedy Graham have been compiling a discussion paper addressing these issues. Now I invite Colin Keating to give his address. Tena koto, tena koto, tena koto kato. I'd like to begin by acknowledging and giving my thanks to the Honourable Trevor Mallard, the Speaker of this Parliament, uh, for his hosting us here uh, this afternoon, um, for his very kind words uh, to us all and to me in particular. Uh, I would also like to acknowledge and thank uh, Her Excellency the Ambassador of the Netherlands, uh, for her words here today. And the other ambassadors uh, who are present, uh, I'd like to acknowledge also Sir Jim McClay, uh, former Deputy Prime Minister and former Permanent Representative, uh, Sir Ken Keith, a former judge of the International Court of Justice. Uh, so many former uh, colleagues that I can't mention you all um, dear friends, thank you very much for joining us here today. I can be very brief. Uh, as Gaia has just said, um, she's invited me here today uh, to give an update because uh, this time last year, uh, as she explained, uh, I was one of the guest speakers and I suggested that it would be timely, necessary and appropriate for civil society in New Zealand to begin to take a lead in a discussion about the way in which the United Nations system could be re-energized, repurposed, and made more effective for our current needs. Uh, little did we know what was ahead of us uh, in 2020 um, with the pandemic of COVID-19. But I think that has simply underlined again uh, the point uh, that we do need to work together or we will all sink together. And so Dr. Kennedy Graham and I uh, have been uh, uh, commissioned by uh, the United Nations Association to prepare a discussion paper uh, on some ideas that would help New Zealand and New Zealanders 
uh, to have an informed and proactive discussion about the United Nations that we would like to see. The methodology that we started out in January and February uh, was to have a very wide-ranging set of interviews. Um, that, of course, was prevented by COVID-19. But since then, we have managed to meet with and discuss and receive input from a very large number of New Zealanders, uh, from former leaders of both of the major political parties in New Zealand, uh, from uh, many other former senior ministers in the governments in, of the past uh, who have had a, an association with United Nations Affairs, from many academics, from many people in civil society, and of course, um, not least, uh, from many former New Zealand practitioners uh, in the area of multilateral diplomacy. We are hoping that this discussion paper will be launched uh, before the end of the year. We had decided it would be prudent to uh, wait before finalising it until uh, not only after the New Zealand election, but also perhaps after another election, which is to take place somewhere else in the world next uh, week, the outcome of which will certainly have an impact on uh, the way in which one would approach uh, the question of reforming multilateralism. For our part, we have, of course, appreciated that there are very, very many uh, areas of reform in the United Nations that one could focus on. One could focus on human rights. One could focus on reforming the General Assembly. One could focus on the fact that there are more than 200 intergovernmental um, entities that are part of the UN system. Do we really need 200 moving parts uh, uh, for delegations? There are major issues relating to UN financing and budget systems. There are major issues relating to the personnel systems, accountability. Um, but we decided that while our discussion paper should have ideas on each of those points, that we should select five or six key areas that would inspire New Zealanders and New Zealand priorities uh, so that this would be a, a treasure trove that would be available for um, Chris Seed and his team, for our new ministers, uh, as and when there is a momentum uh, to begin a process of reform of the United Nations system. I thought I would just highlight briefly uh, the, the key themes which we are working towards finalising at the moment as the key priorities which we would like to lay out in much more detail in our discussion paper. The first is that the United Nations system is renewed so that it has a much better capacity to improve the disparities between the rich and the poor. Now, we all know the UN system is never going to be the principal driver for development or for reversing the current trend of increasing disparities. But it can and should do much better, particularly with respect to the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals. So that is a primary major area which we believe uh, we should produce some, some significant recommendations. The second relates to the fact that the Security Council is no longer uh, the representing an allocation of power that looks balanced, modern, and reasonable in the world of today. Failure to address the 1945 allocation of power has been a root cause of the resistance to past reforms. So we will certainly have proposals relating to a much more equitable and wider representation in decision making. Thirdly, we think there should be practical new collective systems for the prevention of conflict between states and preventing the kinds of civil wars that spill over into wider security problems. Fourthly, 
the system should be renewed with better capacity to deliver outcomes on key issues like climate change and nuclear disarmament. And I was delighted to hear the emphasis which uh, Chris Seed put on both of those uh, themes in the course of his address because I think he's right. They do actually reflect what most New Zealanders hold dear in terms of our commitment to uh, the uh, multilateral system. Fifthly, we think there should be uh, some serious examination of uh, the way in which we hold states accountable and for compliance with international law. Uh, and again, I, I, I reinforce and underline the wise words uh, that uh, the Ambassador of Netherlands made on that subject, and I think we all applaud uh, the efforts over many years that the Netherlands has made to support international judicial institutions. But it remains a fact that the international judicial system that is at the front of the relations between states, the International Court of Justice, um, is in fact not 75 years old, it is actually 100 years old. It was the one part of the previous system uh, that was not renewed and re-energised in 1945. And that uh, pre uh, World War II international judicial architecture is certainly in need of improvement because its jurisdiction remains essentially totally optional. There are too often states who do not want to act in good faith. There are too often inadequately regulated, uh, regulated corporates or corrupt actors who seek to undermine the system putting the law-abiding majority of states at an economic, financial, or political disadvantage. So we are looking at proposing institutional changes that would focus on improving compliance with that part of international law which affects the common good of the whole international community. And I think we can perhaps all appreciate that um, if indeed we get to some serious international rules relating to climate change, we will all collectively have a huge vested interest in those rules being complied with uh, effectively and efficiently and honestly. Last but not least, we think it's important to put before uh, New Zealanders in such a discussion paper the problem of the democratic deficit in our international institutions. Our international institutions were created in a state-centric world. Uh, we have now moved into a world in which civil society exercises a role in, uh, and leadership uh, that was unimaginable in 1945. Uh, and therefore, we need to begin discussing a process at which, in which our international s s system and particularly the United Nations, uh, is more open to and more accessible to civil society as a whole. Now we have also aware that there are many other areas that could end up being priorities uh, for New Zealanders. And not least as those parts of the United Nations system relating to the rights of indigenous people. Uh, we don't think it is uh, appropriate for us uh, to be making specific recommendations in that respect. Um, we recognise that that should be for Māori in partnership with the Crown to come forward with specific recommendations in that regard. Uh, but we will, however, indeed have some suggested elements that may assist such a discussion. Thank you again for uh, listening to uh, all of us today. I uh, have uh, no more that I can reveal at this point in time other than the fact that we are hoping this discussion paper will be available before the end of the year. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katou. Thank you, Colin. Mark Howard, our next speaker, representing the voice of youth. 
National President of UN Youth. Mark Howard is in his fifth year studying law and education at the University of Auckland. As a national president, Mark is responsible for overseeing all UN Youth initiatives. Please welcome Mark Howard. Seven years ago, when I was in high school, I remember our teacher asking us to share our greatest fear with the class. It was a team building exercise, something to build trust between us and to help us to get to know each other a little bit better. So we all had to get up and we had to share with the class what we were most afraid of. And I remember all the usual answers going around the room, spiders, clowns, I actually said escalators on accounts of falling down when I was a child, an experience made worse by the fact that the escalator was going up at the time. Fast forward to last year, a friend of mine was tutoring mathematics for struggling students and wanted an easy icebreaker to run before his first class. He spoke to me about it and I suggested that he run that same greatest fear icebreaker. He liked that idea, so off he went and he ran the icebreaker. A few weeks later, we caught up, and I asked him what the most common fear in his class was. Spiders, clowns, heights. He looked at me, and he said no. It was fear of environmental annihilation through climate change, followed by global nuclear warfare, followed by the erosion of human rights. I was shocked. This was a handful of year 11 students from the same suburb that I went to high school in seven years earlier. And yet these answers were a far cry from clans and escalators. As I went home that evening, I couldn't stop asking myself, what changed? Senator Koto, good evening to you all. My name is Mark Howard, the national president of UN Youth New Zealand, as Guy kindly introduced me. We are Aotearoa's largest uh, for youth, by youth, non-profit organisation with the ultimate goal of inspiring our rangatahi to grow as global citizens. This evening I was asked to share youth perspectives on the UN at 75. Regrettably, this is impossible. I am just one young person of one identity and youth perspectives on any issue are as diverse and varied as youth are themselves. However, what I can do is share with you the common trends that I've identified in five years of having globalization themed discussions with a broad range of young Kiwis through my work with UN Youth. I can do my best to explain how those themes are relevant to us as community leaders and decision makers. Though the story I just shared with you only relates to one group of youth from similar backgrounds, it does represent a growing trend in youth perspectives from all across the world, from Scandinavia to South America. It highlights how youth today possess an exceptional awareness, understanding, and passion to take action on global issues. Cast your minds back to the climate strikes of last year, predominantly organized and attended by young people. And then again to the Black Lives Matter movement of this year, under 25-year-olds were a major demographic in those protests. Back in 2015, when I was in year 13, skipping school to attend a mass demonstration of that kind would have been unthinkable. So what has changed? One major facet is connectivity. Generation Z are more connected to, to each other than any other generation in human history through growing global access to the internet and to social media. For generations, humans have witnessed the impact of global issues exclusively through mainstream media, through TV screens, through newspaper articles, through the words of news anchors. This has the effect of making these stories feel less like real human experiences and more like tales of distant places, so far removed from our own lives that they can almost feel fictional. It makes it harder for us to put ourselves into the shoes of those on the front line against global issues such as poverty, climate change, and racial violence. Through social media, youth today hear these stories firsthand from those people directly impacted by these issues, through the mouths and the eyes of young people just like them. This makes these global issues feel infinitely closer uh, as to when they are heard through the diluted third-party scripts of journalists or newspapers. 
It's like the difference between being at the beach and seeing someone drowning in front of you versus hearing the rumor that someone is drowning around the next headland. In the first case, you feel compelled to take action. You won't simply stand by and watch. In the second case, you might feel worried, you might feel anxious, but it's more likely that you're actually not going to act on the issue. Through the connectivity of social media, our youth today are feeling more and more compelled to take action on global issues no matter where they are happening in the world, even those that are seemingly not New Zealand's problem. Of course, there are more reasons behind this growing globalist trend than social media alone. Our education system, for example, is gradually putting less pressure on youth to spend their time, or spend large amounts of their time, dedicated to studying traditional subjects, giving them more time to experience current affairs, to immerse themselves in global issues and community issues, and to take action to find solutions to them. We're also seeing growing global recognition of youth leaders. One thing that has not changed from past generations is the fact that youth remain highly motivated by and influenced by other youth. When young people see youth leaders being taken seriously by older generations on the global stage, being given a voice at the table, being given decision-making power, we feel inspired to get involved ourselves. So what does this mean for the UN at 75? Well, there is a clear growing sense of globalization among young people. However, this does not automatically translate to a positive perception of the United Nations. A UN that remains indifferent to youth voices today is one that upcoming generations will not be as willing to engage with in the future. And as the UN is already facing increasing indifference, the faith of the next generation is not something we can afford to lose. So what can we do? I've spoken before about the need for greater youth participation and representation within the UN. And that doesn't mean getting a binding youth vote in the General Assembly or in the Security Council. But we do need to show youth that their voices matter on the UN table. We need to make space for them in crucial discussions around global issues. Consider establishing youth seats on decision-making bodies, youth advisory panels on conventions. We need to proactively approach youth as well. We can't just sit idly back and wait for them to come to us, because that's a pretty scary thing for a young person to do. Crucially, we also cannot wait for youth participation to begin from the top down, given the bureaucratic challenges already faced by the General Assembly and other infrastructure within the United Nations. Rather, we, as decision makers and community leaders, should ask ourselves, are we making room for youth in our initiatives? Are we making room for youth in our decisions? If your answer is no, I challenge you to develop youth engagement strategies in consultation with young people. This new global generation can be an incredible source of passion, energy, and creativity for the initiatives that you want to achieve, that we want to achieve. Do not let them go to waste. The other challenge facing us is the need to show youth the value of the United Nations. I can't tell you how many times over the past five years I've had young people come up to me and say, the UN doesn't do anything. And I tell them that the UN does far more than nothing, that it brings crucial aid and stability to millions at a scale unheard of in a pre-globalized era. But then they inevitably ask me, well, fine, but it's been 75 years, and the UN is still grappling with many of the issues that it faced at its establishment. Why can't they do more? And that is a much harder question to answer, because I truly believe there is much more to be done if we are to achieve global peace, global sustainability, and disarmament. And I also firmly believe that the UN is the path to those goals. And of course, there are many, many answers to that question. Too much bureaucracy too little funding, the dangerous effects of factors like silos. But above all, the reason that youth best recognize is this. Fundamentally, the UN's core purpose is to allow nations to talk to each other. And youth don't want the UN to be some sort of coercive global body with a force to compel states into obedience. We want it to remain a positive platform for international communication. But we also know that when states choose to sit in silence on that platform and exclusively look inwards rather than out, the communication stops and progress is not made. There are many examples of this kind of nationalism and introspection on the global stage right now. No doubt you can think of a few. 
But pointing fingers does little good if our own nation is not leading by example. Our little chain of islands in the corner of the world have a history of leading powerful global initiatives and making great achievements in that area. But far from excuse us from silence in the future, that history should compel us to continue to lead global progress, to speak up when others may not. To speak with each other is to empower a united world. And speaking is not just the responsibility of the government, though a large portion certainly lies with them. Let us not forget the power of civil society, of us volunteers and academics, younger and older, to change the world for the better. We have a responsibility to use our voices too and to never give up in doing so. I was asked to share the perspectives of Aotearoa youth on the UN at 75, and again, those perspectives are as diverse as young people themselves. But among those perspectives is a rising globalist trend, and at its core is this. Youth will be watching civil society, watching our governments, and watching governments from around the world to speak up for what is right and for what needs to be done for a better tomorrow. Because youth certainly will be, and we hope to have you alongside us when we do so. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Each year, the Secretary General compiles a, an address to mark UN Day. We shall now play the video message by Louis Aubin, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, Regional Representative to Australia, New Zealand, and Pacific Islands, including the UN General Secretary um, address to UN Day. Distinguished guests, members of the New Zealand government, members of the diplomatic corps, dear friends. Tenakutu, Tenakutu, Tenakutu Katua. In January this year, the Secretary General Antonio Guterres launched the initiative UN75 as the world's largest conversation about current global challenges and the gap between the world we want and where we're headed if current trends continue. Now, a key finding from the consultation identified gender inequality as the greatest single challenge to human rights across the world, alongside the climate calamity, rising poverty, and nuclear weapons. Those who built the United Nations 75 years ago had lived through a pandemic, global depression, genocide, and world war. They knew the cost of discord and the value of unity. Now, our world is not yet what it was envisaged 75 years ago, as we face an unprecedented threat with COVID-19. COVID-19 is a global health crisis, but with human rights dimensions that cannot be ignored. The pandemic has laid bare severe and systemic inequalities impacting populations already made vulnerable. Migrants, refugees, women, children, older persons, people living with disabilities, indigenous peoples, the poor. As the pandemic continues to spread, albeit elsewhere, we need to give attention to those who already struggle to access public health, including mental health services, like adolescents and minorities. The world will get through this crisis, but only if we act together. After all, the world is only as strong as its weakest member. COVID-19 has also revealed that misinformation can have life and death consequences. And so together with civil society, media broadcasters, the private sector, the UN launched campaigns to provide content that cuts through the noise and provides and makes accessible science-backed life-saving information. As we look ahead, we need to rethink the way nations cooperate. After all, in the 21st century, governments are not the only political and power reality. Multilateralism needs to be inclusive drawing upon the indispensable contributions of civil society, businesses, cities, and in particular, with greater weight given to the voices of youth. 
evidence of such all of society approaches is uh, the recently adopted Global Compact on Refugees, a framework widely endorsed, including by New Zealand, for more predictable and equitable responsibility sharing toward the growing number of refugees worldwide. The contributions here made by New Zealand in quite concrete ways are key to how global solidarity is demonstrated. From increasing its annual refugee quota for resettlement, joining the global movement of community sponsorship, and contributing to education and employment pathways for refugees. Positive global leadership is often demonstrated simply by doing things better at home. It's now my pleasure and my honor to share with you the Secretary General's message. Dear friends, the 75th anniversary of the United Nations falls in the middle of a global pandemic. Our founding mission is more critical than ever. To promote human dignity, protect human rights, respect international law, and save humanity from war. When the pandemic hit, I called for a global ceasefire. In our world today, we have one common enemy, COVID-19. We must also make peace with our planet. The climate emergency threatens life itself. We must mobilize the whole world to reach carbon neutrality, net zero emissions of greenhouse gases by 2050. A growing number of countries and companies have already pledged to meet this goal. Around the world, we must do more to end human suffering from poverty, inequality, hunger and hatred, and fight discrimination on the basis of race, religion, gender and any other distinction. The months of pandemic have seen a horrific rise in violence against women and girls. We must build on progress. A remarkable global collaboration is underway for a safe, affordable and accessible COVID-19 vaccine for all. The Sustainable Development Goals give us an inspiring blueprint for recovering better. We face colossal challenges. With global solidarity and cooperation, we can overcome them. That's what the United Nations is all about. On this anniversary, I ask people everywhere to join together. The United Nations not only stands with you, the United Nations is you, we, the people. Together, let us uphold the enduring values of the United Nations Charter. Let us build on our advances across the decades. Let us realize our shared vision for a better world for all. Kia ora. That's a very insightful video message. Thank you, Louisa. Before we end the formal proceedings, it is my pleasure to invite Macy Bentley, our UN's executive officer, to wrap up the speeches by reading the UN Charter Preamble. Kia ora koutou katoa. It's a pleasure to be with you all this evening. Thank you for joining us to mark 75 years of the United Nations. This evening has provided a wonderful opportunity to celebrate the UN, reflect on multilateralism, reaffirm our commitment to shared goals, and of course, enjoy some wonderful speeches from our esteemed guests. Thank you again. Artwork from Whenua Ukai Po Connectedness, and thank you all for being here. And of course, enjoy the company of each other. It seems fitting to conclude the formalities by reading the preamble of the UN Charter and to remember the shared goals that brought the world together 75 years ago, brought us together this evening, and will continue to bring people together in the future. We, the people of the United Nations, determine to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war, which has twice in our lifetime brought untold sorrow to mankind and to reaffirm faith in fundamental human rights, in the dignity and worth of the human person, in the equal rights of men and women, 
and of nations large and small, and to establish conditions under which justice and respect for the obligations arising from treaties and other sources of international law can be maintained, and to promote social progress and better standards of life and larger freedom. And for these ends, to practice tolerance and live together in peace with one another as good neighbours, and to unite our strength to maintain international peace and security, and to ensure by the acceptance of principles and the institutions of methods that armed force shall not be used save in the common interest, and to employ international machinery for the promotion of social and economic advancement of all peoples. Have resolved to combine our efforts to accomplish these aims. Accordingly, our respective governments through representatives assembled in the city of San Francisco who have exhibited their full powers found to be in good and due form have agreed to the present charter of the United Nations and do hereby establish an international organization to be known as the United Nations. Namahi. Thank you, Macy. Distinguished guests, members, and friends, that concludes the formalities for this evening. But I would like to note that the goal of the UNENS is to promote engagement with the United Nations. We firmly support the United Nations to achieve the 17 Sustainable Development Goals by the year 2030. I had many requests about how to join us, how to join up with us, so please go to our website and follow the link or um, you can ask any of our volunteers and they will be able to help you out. But I would like to um, close by expressing our appreciation to the host, Right Honourable Trevor Mallard, for hosting us um, in Parliament today. MFED for all your support in making this event happen. We can't thank enough. Our panellists for the book launch, our keynote speakers, our speakers, Jill Oakley and Simon Bowden for Fenua Ukaipo Connectedness. A special thanks to you, Wendy Hart, for working relentlessly for this day. Joy Dunshed and Peter Nichols for all providing consultation and leadership men mentoring for all the young people in our organization. To Macy Bentley for all your effort and to all United Nations volunteers and not forgetting the supporters. I would like to thank you for supporting this event in the recognition to, of the invaluable goals the UN seeks to achieve. Lastly, I would like to quote the statement made in the video posted in the United Nations website to commemorate the 75th anniversary of United Nations Day. If you could choose one thing, if we all could choose one thing to say to the United Nations, to the world leaders about the future, what would that be? With this in mind, I officially conclude these formalities for this evening. Have an enjoyable evening, have some wine, have great conversation, and we hope to see you over the next 12 months at the numerous events we hold throughout New Zealand which promote the United Nations. Kia ora.